Well, good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Southeast Midlands branch of the Institution of Agricultural Engineers. Um, we can sort of get used to this sort of thing nowadays with meeting um, virtually, but um, I think it brings a nice sort of family feel together when we can actually see other people and uh, not feel too isolated. But um, anyway, this evening gives me great pleasure to welcome Louis Cooper, um, actually teaches at Shuttleworth College, so not too far from a lot of us. Um, Louis is a lecturer that, who specializes in sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, uh, and uh, say is, is lecturing at um, Shuttleworth College in, in Bedfordshire. Um, he also has a London-based firm that is commissioned to research and develop new technologies that bolsters food security, whilst taking care of the financial objectives of his clients. So obviously with a view to ensuring that the, the clients that he's working for don't uh, miss out on being able to actually stay in business. This is a subject that I, I know little or nothing about, but I understand it's got quite a, a big relevance to agriculture, to farmers who've got um, maybe reservoirs on their farms and water on their farms of any sort. So um, if I can invite Louis to uh, start his presentation. Louis, is that okay with you to kick off as it were? And uh, yeah, if people have That's got questions. Fine. Thank you, please, thank you, thanks. Click on the chat and uh, enter your questions as Louis goes along. We can deal with them after the after his presentation. Okay, over to you, Louis. Thank you, and thanks everyone for joining um, and giving me some time to to listen to me tonight. Um, I have condensed things down a little bit. Um, we we planned this before uh, all this this palaver happened, um, so I was expecting to come in and meet you people. Um, from teaching online, which I usually do on a Monday, I find that attention spam uh, is decreased. Some of you might be having a nice beer um, or a glass of wine, and I'm never sure if that's the case for the students as well. So I've kept it a bit shorter than, than usual, but we're covering some really interesting areas, what I hope you find interesting. Um, but at first, I think it's um, important to give a little bit of background into me. Just going to the next slide. Um, so I'm Louis Cooper. Um, and as mentioned, I'm a lecturer in Bedfordshire. So I'm the department lead for my area. Um, so I'm responsible for the student recruitment, all of the teaching and learning, um, the marketing. We've got two CPAS approved fish farms, uh, three mature fisheries, um, and I take care of any other sort of daily business that, that appears on a, on a chaotic day. Um, in conjunction with that, um, I run a business which is starting to get pretty busy. Uh, busy. Uh, with, with new clients coming in. So usually my days are filled teaching and uh, my evenings are filled up doing, doing work and being on the phones. Um, for the past few years, we've um, been getting a lot more work in. So I got to the point in lockdown where I thought I probably should start a company. Um, I've always wanted to be self-employed. I love teaching. Um, but yeah, I, I just like having to sort of set my own trajectory and go in my own direction. So I started a company called Zentel. Um, so following a rapid expansion of the network, so I met a guy called Professor Simon John Davis, and he put me in contact with multiple other people. Um, and eventually our relationships blossomed um, and I started meeting a lot of quite influential um, people at organizations and started getting a lot of freelance work in. So Zentel is a company that gets commissioned by a very diverse um, client base, so recently we've secured some research contracts for newly patented products. Um, and this is, gives the ability to farmers to dramatically uh, increase their yields and enhance protection from disease as well. Uh, we found that this aquatic based product works very well with um, arable practices as well. So we've got some tests coming up in Vietnam um, and across other parts of Southeast Asia. And we're looking at getting that rolled out. If that test is successful, then the company faces a new challenge where we potentially have to supply, I think there's something like 3 million rice fields. So we'll be supplying a lot of people. Um, it's quite a big job for me. It's really important, this one. Um, and it's quite slow moving as you have to wait for a lot of approval from, from different countries, governmental procedures and whatnot. We also offer trade and supply support. So that consists of offering professional services 
um, to firms that produce world-class brood stocks. Um, we help produce them and we help them distribute them all across Europe. So this is the starting point for new start farms. Um, and then it's not uh, uncommon for me to get a phone call at the end of the month where someone's got too much stock as well. So I, I jump on the phone um, and, and start getting selling for them. But also we provide logistical solutions as well internationally. Um, and we look at strategic development to increase clients' market share as well. Uh, and another side of my company, uh, which offers operational sales support. So there's a lot of crossovers of technological advances into the aquatics industry. So this means I work with a lot of different engineers, um, specialist programmers from different areas, which are not my own. I really enjoy doing that because I get to pick up new skills um, and also meet new people. It, it's, it's nice. But we help them transition their products so they meet standards for use in the fisheries and aquaculture industry. So the last maybe two years, they've seen us supply a lot of operational support um, for freelancing. Uh, and now we've got the company established and we've got a good reputation. We're, we're helping setting up some rigorous trials at the moment where we're testing um, new semi-automated fish farming equipment. Uh, and we also end up a UK sales agent as well. So we, we have some, some customers that are very conscious about Brexit and some would say they're very sceptical. So what we do is we try and implement strategies um, and sales hubs in the UK to give them a bit of affirmation, if you like. So this next slide, I just wanted to give you an insight into, you know, I've sort of told you why I started my company with the freelance work. But just to give you some quick details about aquaculture as an industry. So in case you don't know, aquaculture is um, the process of, of breeding or rearing aquatic species uh, intended for human consumption. So it's important to us because there's three main factors, really. Aquaculture now provides us more fish as a food source than wild fisheries do. So this industry of aquaculture is actually absorbing our ever-growing demand for food. Um, and by having more sustainable systems and efficient production lines, we can start bolstering food security. It's easy, or I don't want to say easy, or relatively easy to, to get um, investment into this because it's a consistent market that's been growing um, by what, 40, so the, sorry, for the past 40 years, it's been consistently growing. So it's not, never really showed signs of, of dipping. <clears throat> And also domestic markets um, are still dominated by imports. So 43% uh, of seafood that's consumed in the UK is still actually been bought in from outside of the UK. Now we have some of the best uh, research capabilities, some of the best brains in, in nutrition um, and more operational systems as well. So there's great potential for us to start becoming more independent uh, and less dependent on, on, on imports. And also, um, as you may well know, it's also been holding up the deal on Brexit, the fisheries and aquaculture bill. So it's, it's important standing politically and also for our economic standing throughout Europe as well. So sort of give you a, an example, the most farmed fish in the world is actually carp. So I'm not sure if you guys have, would have probably would have heard of carp. Um, second to tilapia. And then after that, you have species like salmon and trout. And then there's another side of our industry, so it's quite, it's quite broad what we do, but the sport fisheries trade, and this might be a little bit more applicable um, to landowners who have got bodies of water on their sites. You might not necessarily want anglers on your site. I don't really blame you either, um, but there's other potentials to, to make money out of it. But there are some 4 million anglers estimated to be in the UK. Um, a large proportion of them have specific interests in catching the biggest carp. So I'm not sure if there's any carp anglers here, or any fly anglers that are like their salmon fishing or trout. But this demographic tends to have the most disposable income. Um, so I used to work for a, a big sales company, a big brand for, for fishing. Um, and we, we see anglers spending 570 million pounds uh, in the financial year in 2017 on just equipment alone. Um, but the thing is this carp fishing, it does have a threat face to it um, with KHV. KHV is called a herpes virus. Um, it is considered a big threat um, because it, it can cause loss of up to 90% of stocks and it's awfully uh, contagious as well. 
But just to give an example on the screen, I've put up prices of carp. So this is from a mainstream farm based down south. Um, it's quite a lucrative trade. I mean, if you can get 500 kilos of, of fish in, in a few bodies of water and you can rear them on, it's quite little work and there can be big rewards at the end of it. So we've been working with a client as well. And just to give you an example about the demand um, for, for sport fisheries, we've been working with a fisheries company that we collaborated with um, on developing this project that you can see here. Now this company was spending 900,000 pounds a year on just live carp to stock their fisheries. Um, there was a cash rich investor who invested a lot of capital there and a lot of spare money laying around. Um, and he, he plugged 200,000 pounds into to this project here. What you can see here is um, five grading ponds, which carp can go into. And it's surrounded by a galvanized otter fence, which goes three feet down and comes uh, just below the planning regs up and it keeps keeps the otters out. What we're going to do is, is that we, we're producing a similar amount of fish that they demand for a fraction of the price just by using sustainable land development. Um, and I expect to see koi herpes virus grip, grip fisheries up and down the UK. Um, the government do impose legal restrictions on fisheries as well when they're found to be positive with koi herpes virus. So they do pose a real threat to fishery owners and farmers. Um, you, you, you buy security protocols, they have to be uh, quite, quite secure. It's critical. Um, a lot of fisheries are being left vulnerable from, from anglers to be specific, because not all of them have an understanding of bio, biosecurity and a lot of them bring in wet nets and things like that. So that's why it's probably better if you, if you were looking to, to make more of a sustainable income from your land, I would probably go down the stock ponds route and be rearing them. Um, the thing is with koi herpes virus, it may drive the demand up for it. However, a parliamentary committee uh, estimated that a case of KHV could cost overall to include in government costs um, for the environment agency to come out. It could cost them £700,000 overall. So that's it's quite devastating if you're a small business owner, let alone someone that's been established in business for a long time. So another part of my company as well is that we produced education and training. Um, so we have a focus on education and training, particularly in South America, because aquaculture is expanding so rapidly there. However, it sees some of the, the largest depths of poverty uh, and lack of education. So what we've done is uh, in the World Trade Center in Holland, I, I was at um, like a coffee bar and I met a security expert from Apple and we got talking and he wasn't very happy there. So he come on board with the company um, and we designed and developed a training education platform called Blue Green Masters. And this was in conjunction with another company um, that invested in it as well. And what we do is we specialize in aquatic based education. Um, we've got this with world-class security. So you can get your degree once we're approved via biometrics where it will scan your passport and then it will scan your face live on a webcam and through artificial intelligence, it will allow you to verify that person as a real student. Um, and what we've done as well is a, is a tactic called geopricing. Now, it sounds like we're breaking some competition rules here, but we're really not. But what we're doing is, is that, for example, if there's a, an IP address located in South America or a, a wider part of a country, what we'll do is we'll drive the price down of that qualification and have it translated. So some of the poorest people in South America would be able to access these courses for maybe like a euro. Um, whereas in the, in the UK, some courses cost, you know, 500 pounds, some of them cost 5,000 pounds. So it's quite an expensive market. I sort of use my teacher training in here. Um, and I'm not going to take responsibility for, for all the beautiful design and the snazzy features because a lot of that work is not mine. But what my role was really to oversee the quality of teaching and learning on that platform and also how accessible it is to, to our clients. Um, in, the, in the long run, eventually, I would like to provide high quality master's degrees at low costs to students everywhere. So a master's degree in aquaculture in the UK will cost a student, and this is online, £22,000. Um, 
student loans only give around 10 or 11,000 pounds. So the student would have to find another, you know, 10, 10,000, 9,000 to cough that up. Moving on. So some of the business as well has, has allowed me to go around and explore in Europe. Uh, and what it allowed me to do is understand what's going on in the future, what technologies are coming out, what's an upcoming market, and what environmental concerns do we need to focus on and embed into my teaching. Um, I named this, this talk Future Proof in Fish because A, we're using a lot of um, you know, futuristic technology, but also B, we're, we're teaching students and every generation that comes through has started to go to places like university, um, they're getting jobs at places like Angling Water, um, some of them are on high, high end fish farms in Scotland producing salmon. So that they're going out into industry. So it's important to me that we, we equip them with the right ethical package, if you like, and also a futuristic understanding. I feel like the curriculum is, is quite outdated. So most certainly it's down to, to people like myself to, to try and update it and make it more relevant to students. It, it does better equip them for industry. Okay, so going around Europe, we was, um, visiting research facilities. So I went to a place called Tessel Island um, and that is off the coast in Holland. Now Holland is, I think it's like 20 meters below sea level in some places. So a real threat to them is seawater obviously coming on land and ruining all their crops. So there was a small team of scientists studying how to grow crops in saline conditions, which was quite interesting. I expected it to be really salty tasting but actually some of the tomatoes they were produced in, and, and um, what was it, ice lettuce as well, had a really sweet taste to it. They weren't using any chemicals, they were, they were playing around the genetics. Um, and they started a company as well, which we helped with, and they were producing dried kelp and ground up kelp for, for fish and seasoning and things like that. So it's quite an interesting one. Um, and then we went to World Trade Center in The Hague and we met federal business analysts discussing the, the dreaded B words, Brexit, um, and it's quite, it was quite interesting and, and very warming to see that people on a federal level are very open to, to talking with UK based businesses about how they're going to overcome um, the new measures and, and new trade deals or no deal that we might have. Um, I, I, I like doing that international work. It allows me to broaden my horizon, but also understand the, uh, the system that my clients are in. And also collaborate with stakeholders which are involved in them. Um, just uh, the development projects for the Brundtland report. So this was to do with all flood defense as well. Um, the whole trip was funded by another company um, and it was mainly for me to build my, my network up really and just to go and learn some new things because I, I, I could find getting quite bored in just teaching all the time. I like to do new stuff and, and bring some hopefully interesting stories to my students. Um, and technologies as well. So we've just found some investment um, for semi-automated systems. So I produced tilapia and they keep their eggs in their mouth. So how it works is, is the tilapia uh, male will invite a female into his plant pot that I keep in their systems. And the, the female will release her eggs. The male will put his milt over it. And then the female will scoop it up in her mouth and she will fertilize it by tumbling them and then she will keep the eggs moving and she will hold on to them for around 10 days. The problem with that is, is that you're losing 10 days breeding with fish. So we have brought in automated machinery where I extract the fish out with the students myself. Um, and we place these eggs into a custom built um, semi-automated system that will turn the eggs over. And as soon as the eggs hatch, they float up and automatically get transported to a juvenile system. So I've been, for the past few years, I've been, um, improvising on my farm a lot and we've, we've got to a level where it, it, it's, it's in a good place and it's running very smoothly but it's nice to, to bring things up another calibre still and not get too comfortable with what we've got um, and on more of the private work side of things we've been collaborating with engineers that have been developing um, water quality surveillance so these probes um, read different parameters in the water um, so some of them look at the chlorophyll and some of the um, cyanobacteria in the water and it uses artificial intelligence to collate all the processes of elimination and it will give you 
um, a water quality parameter, whether it be ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, the stability, electric conductivity, um, the suspended solids, and it sends them up to that information up to a satellite every four seconds. Um, and then that gets downloaded onto a server. So what I can offer the clients once we test this out is risk forecasting. If you're extracting water, abstracting water from a stream, you want to know what's going on with that water quality in real time. So you can forecast risk. If there's been a pollution or there's a contaminant in the water, you can shut your sluices off and protect your fishery. Um, these engineers don't really have much experience in aquaculture. So again, I'm helping them out. I join their meetings um, and we provide consultancy. So I ask them the right questions to help them get thinking. Um, what else have we been doing on that side of things? We've been working with a few professors in Brazil as well um, on water surveillance. We've been working with a few companies for that. There's almost like there's a technological race at the moment. So there's a lot of non-disclosure agreements being signed. Um, what else was I going to mention? There was one more thing. No. Um, so, if there's time for questions now, thank you for all listening to me. Okay, Zoe, um, if I can ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen. Of course. Then we can uh, see everybody. Okay, good. That's, that's great. No, you, you make me tired just thinking about all the different things you're involved with. I know, I know. <laughs> just, yeah, good for you, though. I mean, fantastic enthusiasm and um, uh, and really going places. I mean, uh, for somebody who's, um, you know, pretty young, as far as I can see from you. <laughs> yeah. I think I've learned the trick is, is not to try and do it all myself. So by, well, by having a, a good contact list, I can always skim work off to people. And, yeah. and, and still get a good job out of it. So it's increasing reputation, um, but also it allows me not to go stressed because I've got family and I've got bags under my eyes, so I don't want to be doing too much. <laughs> no, I was going to say, the, the, knowing what to delegate and when is, is a major asset to, to, to know that and uh, yeah, keep yourself sane. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, I can see some questions coming in. Would you like me yeah. to, to answer some? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Um, I think Alan Plom. Do you want to ask this in person, Alan, about the threat to invasive species from invasive species? It's a fairly obvious, specific question, Louis. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, KHV is not a zoonotic disease, so it cannot be passed um, to humans or any other animals. But that doesn't discount that, that it could ever mutate, but it's yeah. highly unlikely. Um, and you usually find that bacterial infections in fish are rod shaped. And this is for them to travel more freely and more efficiently in water. Okay, thank you. Right, so there. Man um, any, um, and any threat of, from invasive species of any kind? Absolutely. So I'm not sure if anyone's aware of Japanese knotweed. Yeah. Um, it costs the nation a huge amount. It must have been a lot of landowners and arable farmers and livestock. It, it has cost the nation a lot of money. Um, another one is crayfish as well, I would say. Um, crayfish, not from an ecological perspective as such, of course, there are out competing our native stocks, but also they can cause bank erosion. So, so structural damage in towns is, is, is a big one. Um, and apart from that, I would say to people is, is the standard blue-green, blue-green algae, cyanobacteria and things like that. Um, and another question, so what got into fish? So I was really, re I grew up in Essex on the border of London um, and I've got Cockney family. So I come from a very, very common family. You won't hold that um, against you. I certainly <laughs> won't. Though. We've got the same accent, mate. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I, my, my dad always loved fishing. I used to look at him thinking, what is all this about? And I wasn't very good at school and I got into fishing and we had an employment talk at school and this guy got me into it. So uh, fast forward a few years and skip a long story. I end up working for a big brand, working with Russia, the US, most of Europe. Um, and at, at 18, I was turning over 14 million pounds in a sales team of four. Um, and it, it got, it peaked quite quickly. And I thought you could hang on and get caught in this or you could move on and do something different. Um, and I had a phone call from the college saying, Louis, would you be interested in a job here? And I couldn't understand why, because 
if I could tell you some of the stuff I got to off at college, I weren't, <laughs> I weren't the greatest student, but I got my work done. Um, but I said yes, and I took the job. Um, and we turned up, and it was, sorry, I, I missed out. I, I studied at this college as well. Um, so I ended up coming back here for a job. Um, and I turned up, and the fish farm was dry. There weren't much going on. There were six students. So I, I sort of turned my business brain on. I thought, let's get a few easy wins, and let's get the fish farm started. And we started meeting um, all these interesting people. So I started meeting people from GlaxoSmithKline, um, from functional feed companies. Uh, people have ended up paying for my flights to, to fly out and see them. Um, and it was it, it sort of took off, really, and completely self-taught in, in, the, in the sector after leaving college. Um, I started teaching when I was 19. So at university, uh, to do that course, you've got to be 21. So I signed the employment contract and I got to university and I was in the admissions office and I looked at it and I put my head in my hand thinking I've just given up this good job and I can't even do the uni course because I'm too young. Um, but that yeah, the, the university let me on and, and when I graduated, I think I was probably one of the youngest lecturers in the country. Um, and it was just off the merits of freelance work I was doing. So I was intent on proving myself and getting them small wins in. And yeah, the fish farms really took off now. That's a supplementary, Tim. So what university was that, Louis? That was the University of Bedfordshire. Okay, yeah, um, through, through Shuttle. I had an off yes, that's right. And um, I had an offer from St Andrews to go and do sustainable aquaculture there. It, it cost £22,000. So I thought I'd put the business first. And I enjoy what I'm doing. And I'm learning more than I think university could teach me because I'm, I'm actually doing it in real life and working with the real people that, that are teaching them subjects in them universities. So I know that any time I could ring them professors up um, and they'll answer my queries. And I sometimes sit there for hours writing notes on the phone as well. So it's free lectures. <laughs> I, I mean, that was a point um, I was going to ask you actually about the universities, because you would assume with all the research in terms of marine aquaculture and salmon farms and so on in the locks that that would all be taking place in Scottish universities. So it's it's surprising to have that sort of hub in, in almost as far away from the water as you can get. Yeah, we're completely landlocked here. And probably my biggest crime is all of the water on my fish farm comes from a tap. Um, but we, we try and apply the same concepts. And there's new technology being brought out called bioflock systems. Now, bioflock systems is um, a very, very precise combination of different bacteria that can produce conditions where you can breed shrimp inland um, with just standard water. Um, and you can do salmon with it as well and other saltwater species. So it's, um, it's certainly involving. It's certainly involving. Okay, let's... Rather than, than me type this question, maybe I ask it straight to you. Louis, you, you, I forget what, how many millions it was you, you said you, you, your company was turning over in, when you were quite young. Did you have any actual money start up for that company or how did you so actually that, get off the ground? My company personally doesn't turn over millions, but the company I started working at, so the guy I met at school who took me on, the big fishing brand, that was the company I was turning over £14 million pounds, um, in a sales team of three. So we had our European territories, our Russian territories, um, US, and we was expanding in South Africa as well. Um, and that's when I've decided to, to, to bridge the leap and, and go self-employed. Um, I think that it, it comes a lot about money. And that's, although, you know, I understand the importance of finance and I've got a business acumen, um, yeah, I'm not all about that. I enjoy it. I, lo I love having a day with the students. Um, I, I like to say I do my lessons a little bit differently. So when I'm in the classroom, if they're not feeling it, I'm not going to force an hour and a half lecturer uh, and a lecture. So I ask them what they want to do. And, and we've got the privilege of throwing their boots on and getting them on the farm as well. So we're quite hands on. Yeah. You, you can never sort of predict your day with, with teaching rather than being on the phone to a different country every day. Yeah, yeah. So have you had to uh, get capital to move your company on? Um, how has that worked for you? So I've had, so this year we've had three offers of capital ranging from around 10 to 60,000 pounds. And I've not accepted any of it because they wanted 
a large proportion of shares. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I just it, it, I just want to retain control, really. But I accepted um, some investment through assets. So I accepted uh, like in technology and machinery and things like that instead of cash top ups. Um, but at the moment, I, I've maybe spent three thousand pounds on starting that business up myself. That was it, really. And that's the website, plane travel, um, and expenses like that. Mm. Um, and I also accept weird and wonderful jobs. So at the moment, I had a, an odd phone call the other day where um, this guy's got a rooftop um, penthouse. So it's like a terrace on his penthouse. And he wants a fish tank installed in there. So uh, mm. um, it's a bit of an odd request. But I said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll 100% do this. So I called up a uh, bespoke designer that I know. I've got some architects to go in there and, and we're designing that at the moment. So you can never really predict what the business is bringing in, but certainly I'll never turn, turn that sort of work away. No, right, right. Yeah, in it for ending. I see uh, Alan's yeah. got another question there. Alan, do you want to uh, unmute? And... Yeah, my, my aquaponics question, I presume. Um, yeah, I, I just want to, obviously, you're, in terms of field scale, you're working with paddy fields and so on, but they're, I'm aware of a few sort of small scale aquaponic projects going on. Is that going to be a growth area? It will be a growth area when we start figuring out ways to make it cheaper to go. So the Europeans are more on it than us. So when I go to Holland and the colleges in Holland, um, their technology is is far superior. But I have got two aquaponic setups. Um, One I grow tomatoes on, another I grow quite an exotic plant on. Um, and I do think it's an area for growth. When we run out of arable space for arable land to, to, to ratio of population, or even that we carry on building on green belts and the price of land becomes unsustainable for farmers, then certainly our, our surface area is improved when we go vertical. So in the future, I predict that we'll be incorporating LED technology, um, recirculation, aquaculture systems, um, and yeah, so polyculture, if you like, I do think it's the future. There's a lot of small scale startups that are just not profitable to do it. Um, unfortunately, one of my clients, he come to me a week away from bankruptcy in, in Holland. Um, and I really, I was sad about it because I really see the vision of their business. But I think when you have too many um, scientists in one room and not enough business people, the right decisions don't get made. Sorry, <laughs> bad, but I... Yeah, John. John, uh, you want to ask your I, question? <laughs> that is me go thing, John. I've been following this. Oh, sorry, I've skipped a question. Do you okay. see aquaculture taking over from fisheries? And if so, what are the implications of that in fish quotas? So, I think that it will have no choice. I think there is a superior market for wild caught salmon, and people will continue to pay the increase in price for it. But aquaculture is mostly facilitating um, our, our, our fish shelves. The reason taking over fisheries, I think fish quotas become less valuable. But the tongue-in-cheek bit is that you're right. Debenhams m- might employ more people than than the fisheries do. But from a political viewpoint and how strong you are, um, particularly to do with naval vessels as well and things like this it's most certainly an ego thing. Um, it's, a, it's a strong political stance, an economic stance to rule the waters around you and not be congregated by Europe. So, so yeah. Mm. Um, and in the future, <laughs> I, I, most def- I most definitely do see it. So they say by 2030, 76% of all fish produced will be for human consumption. Um, in previous days, it used to take 1.2 tonnes of fish meal to produce one tonne of salmon. So our nutritionists have come so advanced now that we're producing one tonne of salmon with just one tonne of food stuff. So we are getting there. We are getting there. That's, that's, that's quite an achievement, isn't it? Massively, yeah. But if we just kept the status quo, going back to my tongue in cheek, if we just kept the status quo, it's not going to make any difference to the fishing industry, is it? Potentially. But what we need to remember is that we're dealing with a biological stock. So depending on the commercial use of that area, that could impact of, of, of the ecosystem. So there's nothing to stop them quotas being diminished. And if we've got our eggs scaled into too few baskets, then we could potentially 
lose a lot of jobs. And yeah. from a, a policy point, maybe, but from a voting point, if you see a, a rustic, hairy fishman be made redundant, people will see that as an attack on British culture. Yeah. Are there any further questions? I was going to say, any other questions, anybody? Um, I think what, yeah, I mean, how, I, I guess I, I would, I would think your students, uh, Louis, uh, are, are pretty much enjoy your lectures because you're coming from such a, a sort of innovative and, um, you know, you're pushing the, the boundaries and, and really making it, I, I guess they're going to listen a lot to you. And, and do you feel that you're inspiring them to get into the fish industry? Do you, have you had any experience of students really coming um, and they want to get into it? When I first got there, I looked at the, the structure and the framework of the course and it didn't really feel like we were set them up for somewhere. So I made the course really three main channels that you can aim for. And they're, they're, they're wide industries, it could be anything, but at least it gives them a sense of direction. And I incorporate that with the curriculum. Um, and one of the biggest things for me is that everybody should get the same standard of education and opportunities, no matter where they come from. Um, so it's always a big thing before I book a trip, I pre warn students that I know come from low social economic backgrounds. We've, we've sent people that never traveled before to Japan to go and study koi farming. I was up till midnight getting him a scholarship, you know, um, typing away. We've, we've taken people to places abroad that never been before to meet people who never, never would have met. So, and when you see them apply that and go to university after and use them, them props, it doesn't really stroke my ego, but it makes me feel like the job I get up to do in the morning is worth doing. Um, and it gets you through the, the, the sort of the hard days because it's, it's quite an uncomfortable job to do. Um, yeah, so it, that, that's mainly for me is, is that. And when I first started, a lot of well, the, my first ever lecture, the woman looked at me and she said, you're so young, you're really <laughs> going to struggle on your first, on your first day. She riled me. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my first lesson, I ended up teaching the wrong class. And I didn't realise, but I knew quarter of the way in that I thought you just need to finish this lesson, Lou, and play it off. And I did. And in the second class, which was the correct one, it went really well. And the students show a real um, degree of loyalty to me. Um, and it makes it easier because th there's a common goal. Well, I want them to get them to be see where they want to be in life. And if they're doing that, that makes my job easier because they're not skipping off and skipping their assignments. So. Yeah, it's, it's most definitely a teamwork thing. And I couldn't run the fish farm without my students. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. I can get the whole, all of the farm areas done in, in 45 minutes. I give everyone a job to do and they wear their masks there. And if you come in on a visit, you can just see everyone flying around and things being passed. It's just, it's a very efficient operation. And yeah, without them, I wouldn't be able to run the fish farm on my own. Mm. So talk about, I, I, Alan's got another question, but just while you're on the topic of aspirations, uh, what, what have you got a particular aspiration from from here where where are you aiming um i'd like my company to be uh running quick enough where i could be running it full time uh and be closer to my family because i'm quite isolated from my family up here um but i'd still love to be involved with something student focused so maybe having a fish farm once a week where students come and visit and, and have a day with me learning hands-on tactics. Right. Very good. Yeah. And Hello. someone saying I need to speak to Douglas from the Trust, me, etc. cetera, for potential research funding. That's Alan Plum. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll write that down. <laughs> yeah, I can give my email out. I can get my email um, sent across. Yeah, do that, Louis. Uh, my, my sort of rider to, to that was, do you consider yourself to be an agricultural engineer? Um, I'm going to say no, because when something goes wrong in my fish farm, I'm like a hybrid between a hands-on handy person and a pen pusher. So I'm like half entrepreneurial, half scientist. So I, I, um, I think we would beg to differ, because we're a very broad church, you know. And um, yeah. oh, Jane might have something to say about that as well. But, uh, you know, aquaculture is all part of what we deal with as well. And, and it's quite interesting. Um, I mentioned there the Douglas Bonford Trust. So we, 
We fund PhD, MSc level research. We fund A-level students to get them into engineering. Uh, okay. and, then, and then all the way through and study tours. And it's about developing individuals to encourage them and enable them to develop in the industry. And, yeah. and uh, we've, we've supported individuals, enthusiasts, entrepreneurs like yourself in the past and the engineering that's going on. So um, <clears throat> if you ever uh, needed some pump priming money, um, you know, there's there, there, there's money in the pot for those sort of projects. If if it's got some uh, benefit and relevance to agriculture engineering in the UK, the work can be international. It doesn't have to be in the UK as long as students are, or, or, or the companies are based here. No, I, I do like being aware, especially for me, for my own projects, but also for, for students as well. Um, I've always been pretty pretty self-sufficient but I know there'll probably be a point or maybe in the future I know that a student who's trying to start a business himself that might need help um, it's very useful for me to know about things like that mm, yeah I'll just have a look on the website google Douglas Bonford Trust right well if you put your email up I'll, I'll contact you anyway yeah I can put that in there actually oh, I'll put it in there yeah put it in the chat He'll be writing a proposal by midnight, Alan. Yes, he will. <laughs> <laughs> how I've, I've how many millions tea. does this man need? <laughs> I've been drinking. I'm going to have a beer after this. <laughs> <laughs> There's my email in there. Great. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, always. So when you guys get back into to meet in person, person, we'd love to come down and or maybe do another one of these as well. Yeah, that 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 would be good, and um, and particularly well. Shuttleworth, because we're the South East Midlands branch, we're always looking for potential summer visits. So um, maybe that's uh, that's something we could do. Come and actually, uh, we we could roll out the red carpet. I th I'm sure we could do something. That, that maybe would be an great. afternoon tea. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems like a like a, a sort of dream at the moment. But um, yeah, yeah. maybe try and sneak in the collection as well. I know we've got a few Spitfires laying around. Oh, right, yes, <laughs> yes, that would uh, that would be a, a, a good visit. Um, any any, any other questions, anybody? Uh, well, I'd say Tim, I'm just reeling. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot. I'm probably a bit of a whirlwind for you. Sorry. No, no, that, that's fantastic, Louis, and and thank you very much indeed on behalf of everybody in this evening. It's be, been a really entertaining evening and um yeah it just just shows with the uh, with knowledge and enthusiasm you can go a long way and um you know the, the world's your oyster and uh, i think you're going to make the world you know <laughs> thank you that means a lot yeah, forget the pun but <laughs> i don't think people got alan's joke as well alan made a very funny joke saying he was reeling from it i thought that was very good <laughs> alan. very good <laughs> excellent yeah. <laughs> much, much too subtle, Alan. Didn't get that one. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Well, um, yeah, we've. I, I guess we ought to be thinking about the next meeting, John. Have we got something lined up for that? I'm just trying to remember. January. I haven't got my program card with me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you, you will have a quick check. I, I think I'm doing there. something, boys and girls. Yes, it's James. Oh, James. Yeah. James is doing good. James. Yes. How could stand, I up, stand up routine. How could I have forgotten? I'm sorry about that, James. January. Mental January aberration. what? What what date was it? I think it's the eleventh. Eleventh was it? Yeah. Eleventh to the fifteenth. We better all get the same evening. Is it the eleventh? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be well, talking to me. The 11th is a Monday, so I think it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah probably is. Well, look out for the advert for that, because that, 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 again, will be an entertaining evening. And uh, <laughs> thank you thank you again, Louis. Uh, that's been a fantastic Lovely. presentation. Yeah. Really appreciate yeah. that. So thank, well you, thank you, Louis. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Okay. okay. And to you. Bye.